we are talking about the topic, making refill happen. And we have some experts here to discuss how they do it. How do they make refill happen? What are the challenges that they've overcome? And how can you replicate that as part of the audience in your community, wherever you are? Um, hopefully it's something that, uh, that you can take with you and take action. That's the whole idea of Zero Waste Month, right? Um, so please get inspired, get motivated, and let's get to zero waste together. Race to zero waste together. Um, if you're with us in the live audience, you have the chat box, which is that direction. I think I'm pointing in the right direction this time. Um, and so you can ask questions to our speakers and you can make comments about what they say, agreeing, disagreeing, adding to the discussion. Um, you're part of this too. So please share your comments and your thoughts and your questions, answer the polls as they come up and, uh, and let it be an interactive space for everyone to, to contribute to this discussion. So first, before we get started, I want to go ahead and thank our sponsor. As you see on the screen here, I'm going to say a big thank you to Zero Waste Sonoma, who is sponsoring Zero Waste Month this year. And if you would like to become a sponsor, we are still open to it. We're halfway through the month, um, but we, we'd be happy to have those conversations. So please reach out. And then I also have... Our collaborating partners, so our speakers and promotional partners, thank you so much to everyone who is part of this, has been part of this, um, and is sharing actions and sharing about Zero Waste Month on social media to uh, make this campaign possible. So these are all of our current promotional partners and speakers. And if you want to get your logo featured, share your action, share your, you know, share that you're part of Zero Waste Month, that you support this campaign. And we'd be happy to have you as well. And now I will get to our introductions of the wonderful people who are here with us um, for this talk. So I'm Hayden Sloan, Strategic Director of Communications of Race to Zero Waste. And we are hosting these talks this month. And we're very excited to have our special guests. And I'm going to start off with Kelly. Will you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, y'all, to speak with you. My name's Kelly Dennings. My pronouns are she and her. For those that are unable to see me, maybe watching this as they're on the treadmill or something, um, I'm a short, white, middle-aged woman with short brown hair standing in my office. Um, I like to always acknowledge that I'm on stolen Miccosukee, Tamuqua, and Seminole land, also known as Florida, where many individuals face displacement, and we hope one day they receive restorative measures. Um, a little bit about the center. Is that where I should go next um, and the organization? Okay. So we're a national nonprofit conservation organization that works through a combination of science, the law, activism, and creative media to protect the wild places and the wildlife um, around the country. So we know that we're dealing with overlapping crises and drivers. And while we need to change our systems from stopping fossil fuels, transforming what we eat and holding polluting corporations accountable, we are aware that we need individual behavior change also. And I think that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so we work on uh, plastic reduction, reuse, food waste, conscious consumption, and low waste holidays and celebrations, along with some systems level changes on the plastic side of things, trying to decrease pet chem build out, um, you know, getting the GSA to stop buying single use plastics, and then working to make the food code more permissive to reuse, which I think is applicable to today. So that's a little bit about me. Thank you so much, Kelly. And next we'll have Margo. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Margo. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm in Portland, Oregon, which is on the Multnomah, uh, Chinook, Cowlitz, and Wasco lands. Um, I am the Portland Network lead for Ecopy Reusables, and we are a, repop, uh, a reusable cup service for cafes. Um, we really want reuse to be accessible to everyone, and you should be able to have access to it when you do something as simple as go get a coffee and you forget your, your own cup. Um, so I manage all our cafe outreach. Um, I also kind of act as like a waste consultant for small businesses and cafes, um, just sharing knowledge and connecting community organizations. So we do a lot of that cross weaving work um, with different orgs. And it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. So thank you. 
Thanks, Margo. We look forward to hearing your perspective. And Kelly? Uh, sorry, Yayoi. <laughs> Go in the order. Y'all switched orders on my screen somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, um, my name is Yayoi. I am the founder of Zero Waste Ithaca, uh, located in Ithaca uh, in central New York. And also I'm a co-founder of BYO US Reduces. Uh, I'm thrilled and honored to be here and share our journey with you. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, Zero Waste Ithaca is a local group of uh, BYO US Reduces and uh, BYO uh, means uh, bring your own container and uh, napkins, jars, anything you can imagine for the fourth letter. Uh, BYO initiative is a fresh flagship program. And uh, we've enlisted locally in Ithaca over 100 businesses to support BYO. Our goal is to pass regulations to make uh, a BYOC, like container, bring your own container, the norm in the US as it is in other countries. Uh, BYO US reduces focuses on uh, BYO, but we also hope to expand into broader zero waste actions in the future when we one day <laughs> normalize uh, BYO in the US. Um, uh, we are supported by wonderful organizations such as Gaia Global Alternative for uh, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives uh, Beyond Plastic, Upstream Solutions, and Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, and we are also, we work also with uh, uh, our sister groups, sister organizations uh, in Canada. Canada reduces from where we drew inspirations from. And we are also in uh, touch with uh, uh, BYO Containers, uh, dot org. exactly the name. Uh, is an um, Australian organization that has the exact namesake name for their organization. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. I feel like that was such a wealth of networks. That's amazing. Um, so, you know, there are resources out there. If you're interested in BYO and in implementing this, like this is part of it, right? Learning what's out there, what's already happening and how you can bring it um, into your community and, and help make it happen. And so, yeah, that's amazing. I feel like I just learned so much in the, that like one minute that you were talking. Um, so great. All right, well, let's get started with, um, with a couple of questions about uh, reuse and refill. Um, so yeah, let's think about how how to get started. Um, so you can think from your perspective of the organization that you work for and things like that. Um, you know, how do we go from this restaurant is using styrofoam or this, you know, store is using plastic packaging? How do we go from that to being like, I'm bringing my own container, please let me refill it. Um, what are kind of the steps that we're taking to make that happen? And I think I'll let Margot go first. And then whoever wants to chime in next. Yeah, so this is a huge part of our work is just showing that it's possible to take someone who's at this defensive, um, really just like at uh, mercy of the the single use problem um, and taking them and showing them that a reusable world is possible. Um, so we tell a lot of people or customers or copy users that want to expand their our network um, to ask at your at the restaurant or the cafe you go to and be like, can I like a reusable is an option? Um, do you have a cup I can use like an actual cup? or can I bring my own? Um, and customer demand is really shows a lot of owners and managers that it is something that customers care about and that they should care about as well. Um, because there's only so much that I can do sometimes as like in my role. Um, so having customers ask for that um, is really huge. So that's definitely something that we, we share out. We've kind of thought about using the hashtag just ask for that kind of campaign. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can make it happen after this after this chat, because I think that's so important. And it takes like, you know, you gotta get over your kind of anxiety about making the, you know, rocking the boat. Sorry, go ahead. Don't even know that people want to. And so like, sometimes they're totally open to it, but they would, would, wouldn't have thought of it. Um, so I think that's good hashtag. I would, I'll use it for a copy. <laughs> nice. All right. We're going to start it. You heard it here first. Hashtag just ask. 
I'll, I'll say um, when I worked in recycling, this has been a number of years ago now, uh, I worked for the state of North Carolina and they had just passed a law that said bars and restaurants had to recycle. And um, we did the same thing. We were like, consumers need to ask for it, you know, and help educate that the bars and restaurants were now supposed to be recycling. And we had these things that we would give out that I called them palm cards. I'm not really sure. Uh, they were just business cards and you would put them into like your, um, you know, those things that they give you when you go to a restaurant to pay your bill and your receipts inside of it. And you would leave a thing that's like, I would really love it if this restaurant were to be recycling. <laughs> And it was just like a non-confrontational way that you could kind of just like say it, but not have to say it. Um, I don't know if it worked, but anyway, maybe we need that. That's like, I would like you to be refilling. And it's just a little card. So. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. Okay. And Yayoi, do you have some thoughts about how we get from point A, which is our linear system now to point B, a reuse system? I. Yes, um, I wanted to comment on like what both Margot and Kelly said, like, uh, so just, you know, this whole thing about just ask, uh, hashtag just ask is that like that we ask the, uh, we put the sticker on uh, for uh, at the storefront of the local businesses. And so that like, you know, it, when the customers come over, they can see that you don't have to give spiels and why you're doing it, like you know why, you know explaining about the you know whole plastic pollutions and things like that. So um, I think that's like uh, one of the ways we can uh, do it uh, uh, to just um, to you know display the sticker. And it might seem seem like such a simple idea, but um, this becomes a collective endeavor. Like, you know, if it, it's not just one person doing it and because we are doing it as a group, um, it, it had some impact and it creates such a feel good stories in the community. Um, and we got, we got some uh, local press coverages too. And so, um, so in that way, it seems like such a small things, but like it's actually quite uh, impactful uh, at the local level. Um, and the way it spread in Canada, uh, we uh, got this idea of uh, you know how to uh, organize this like uh, you know bring up your own container campaign from can can our Canadian counterpart, uh, and um, uh, we borrowed the ideas and then uh, it, it started in the small neighborhood of uh, Ronsi in Toronto, and then it just spread across Canada. Um, it, 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 ha it got like a local media attention and then, you know, like regional and national. And so I think it's just a, a, a way to uh, make a difference as an ordinary uh, citizens uh, uh, to make an impact. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And sorry, go ahead, Margo, I'll let you. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was just gonna say this beyond like refill, I think another push for reusables like for dine-in uh, is a huge thing that comes before I think refill sometimes. Um, and I rethink disposables is doing great work in terms of like providing case studies and cost analysis of how much restaurants can actually save um, if they use disposables. Um, so that's just one resource that could help people who are trying to convince their local uh, restaurant or cafe. I can put it in the chat. Yeah, that sounds great. And we'll pass that on to the, to the audience on YouTube live as well. And, um, I was just going to say that that small actions that make a big difference, like that snowball effect is exactly what we're doing with zero waste month, right? Our actions like take your own bag to the grocery store and things like that may seem small, you know, once it, especially once it becomes a habit, you're like, well, I always carry my bags. Now what's the next step? What do I do? Because there's still so much plastic and so much waste in the world. Um, but it counts. It does keep doing it. <laughs> um, so part of zero waste month is also encouraging and motivating that. And then I'm going to jump off what Margot just said too, is, you know, convincing people. And so my next question is what are your best messages to convince a shop owner or convince a restaurant owner or even convince someone 
you know, just like on the street, like a normal person, a friend, a family member, like to bring their own. Um, so what are, what are our best arguments that we have here? Um, if I may, I think the best argument is how much the business saves the money by switching to reusables. And uh, just uh, what uh, Margot mentioned, we think disposables uh, cost saving calculation uh, posted on their website. Uh, it's just so wonderful. And it's even if it's like a, a slightly older uh, numbers from 2018, and now the cost is even the saving is significantly higher after the COVID period. Uh, but even the old numbers can just clearly show how much the businesses save. And um, I was also at the uh, workshop uh, with uh, 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 the uh, Grace Lee of the uh, Rethink Disposable, and she canvassed uh, businesses uh, to switch to uh, reuse for on site dining. And uh, so we could relate so much because we did the same thing for BYO. And, um, uh, so um, I think um, um, what I wanted to say was, I think, it, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, the, my, I lost the trail of my thought, I'm sorry, I, I uh, but um, yeah. I can jump in. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of convincing people, I love the, well, I don't love this stat, but it's a very helpful stat that Portland goes through a million cups a week. Um, and whether you use an Okapi cup or you bring your own or you even have coffee at home, uh, any of those is going to help that number go down. Um, and also just knowing where your trash goes. I think it's really helpful to reference that. Like in Portland, our trash goes east like 150 miles in trucks. And so like that alone is like, okay, your coffee cup that you used is taking this truck, like you're paying for it to go out there to the dump. Um, so just connecting the dots, I think for people, because so much of it is hidden. Um, and so just willing to, yeah, answer their questions. And it's hard to find the line of not being too pushy though. That's definitely something that um, is like most important, I think in those conversations. I'll say, um, I know we're talking about individual actions and yes, you can skip the straw and bring your cup, but I think of individual actions as also relating to advocacy. <laughs> so, um, you know, we need to be advocating for state and local food codes to be permissive of reuse because <laughs> it's frankly not really permissive uh, in most parts of the country. and. So you need to learn what is currently permissive and then advocate to change your state food codes. And while you're waiting to change your state food codes, you should advocate for local variances mm -hmm. because state food codes can take four years to change. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanna kind of bring in a little bit of the systems level changes um, because we at most definitely should be, you know, doing all that we can currently, but we need to be working to change. Um, change the larger I, system. I 100% agree. I mean, like I, I agree like 1,000, 10,000 millions and billion percent agree with it. The part of the reason we created this like the US reduces network for BYO is because of the very prohibitive laws at different states for the BYO. And um, because the program came from Canada where it is you know, generally permitted and even promoted by local governments, um, you know, it was a surprise for us that we can't do it. And uh, for, at the local level, uh, where when our um, wonderful uh, Zero Way Chef, who is a, um, you know, she is one of the co-founders of uh, US Reduces, uh, introduced us to this like uh, BYO sticker actions uh, from Canada, uh, we didn't expect this, so much problems, uh, but she was located in California where it's one of the most progressive states in terms of BYO. Um, and uh, like, you know, when she shared that with the rest of the country, like, you know, there are so many problems, including in New York. So in our area, uh, we passed, uh, we convinced the health department uh, to allow BYO uh, 
because our state's health code doesn't have anything explicitly uh, prohibiting uh, BYO. Um, so we were allowed to do that for about like uh, 10 months or so. Uh, and it was great when we have this like support from the health county's health department. It was smooth sale, it was really great. And then uh, we heard uh, they were, uh, they received some uh, letter or call or something from the state, New York state uh, health department because other allies in around the state wanted to do the same thing. It's a great program, everybody loves it. Um, and then uh, they said, um, you know, they, they, and then they start saying no. And so now in New York, we are allowed to uh, uh, BYO for the beverages and also pack out leftovers uh, from the restaurants and food vendors, but we, we cannot uh, do a food BYOC that's allowed in other countries and in California. And this, uh, I feel, really needs to change. And you know, uh, in, in other states, it's even more challenging. And I, I think it's kind of ridiculous that we have to fight so hard for such a no-brainer, common sense, safe practice, uh, simple, very simple practice that we can do to reduce waste. Uh, it's the first defense of uh, most people, um, you know, everybody, all citizens around the world against uh, 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 plastic pollution pushed down on us through uh, those corporations. Um, and so it's just really unfortunate that like uh, we have to fight so hard uh, uh, for this. And I hope that we can normalize this, you know, with our teeny little bitty grassroots actions, but put together with so many people <laughs> across the country, maybe we can change this in a few years, I hope, because I'm so tired of it. Yeah, I think, so I think everyone is. Um, and that actually ties in directly to a question that we got from the audience, which is, is it hard to get a municipal code changed that doesn't allow for reusables for dine-in? Um, so I think this is maybe related to kind of fast food chains and things like that, or I'm not sure exactly which ones don't allow reusables for dine-in, but like that's a big thing if they don't. Um, but kind of thinking about getting these municipal codes changed, what's the pushback that you've seen and, and how do we get over those hurdles? I, I can try to take it. I'm not in a municipal government that has done this, but we have had folks present to our coalition about it. And I think it is in the eye of the interpretation of your local health department. So as Yayoi said, most 32 states are on a federal food code, which is just guidance. So not law of the land, but 32 states use a federal food code that is permissive of what she just said. I can take my own container and I can put my leftovers in it at the table and I can bring my thermos or my, my drink and, and take my own container to a, um, a fountain machine and, and fill it, right? As long as it doesn't go behind the counter and it doesn't have milk or things in it. So one, we need to be educating that that is acceptable because people are not even doing the bare minimum that is actually permissive in 32 states. I'm not even gonna talk about the other states that, <laughs> that are not even at the bare minimum. Um, so when it comes to the other things like um, a restaurant providing a container to go that you bring back. Honestly, very few places want to do this. I have an example here though. So this is my smoothie shop and I bought their cup. I get my smoothie. I take it. I bring my cup back and I get a smoothie, right? But not every, they're in the business of making smoothies. It's rare that you find a restaurant that wants to also be washing things. So, um, that comes at the interpretation of a local inspector, you know, um, so there's a lot of things that have to happen, you know, it has to be made for reuse, it has to be visibly clean, it has to be washed in hot water, you know, there's all these things that you have to stipulate and so um, it can be done if you have 
you know, a willing and interested health department, I think, because it is in the regs. They just um, need to help the restaurants figure it out, you know, and, and um, some of the newer uh, food codes that have been passed say, okay, I want a plan from restaurant A, B, and C that says this is how I'm going to handle uh, material containers that are brought back to me. So I can see that, yes, you have something on the wall that says I'm going to visually inspect this container after it is washed in hot water. And, you know, um, so I think there needs to be a little bit of, um, frankly, just interest from the, the local health department to to work with um, advocates and grassroots folks coming to them. Um, but it, it has happened. It's Philly. It's, um, you know, Massachusetts has done them. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia has done them. So there are communities that that have created local variances and you just have to work with your health department. Yeah, I feel really lucky to be in Oregon because we Oregon has been doing a great job um, health code wise of letting not just reusables, but also like bringing your own to refill shops um, and getting that officially cleared. Um, but there is kind of a mismatch of like where there are ordinances and things in place and then where there are community groups that help enact those ordinances. Um, so we're in Portland where um, there's lots of community groups, but there's no ordinance or anything that says there has to be reusables for dine-in um, or compostable um, to-go containers. And we also have a network that's in um, California in the Bay Area. And in San Mateo, for example, they have an ordinance that says it has to be compostable um, foodware for to-go, but there are less local orgs that are willing to like uh, promote that or help restaurants tr transition to that and it's not being enforced so the mismatch of like ordinances and willingness and um businesses that are willing to try it is is pretty varied um but i feel yeah in oregon it's it goes it goes pretty smoothly um we have lots of support um and the deq the department of environmental quality is is actively expanding their um networks to try and help more businesses so uh, and we kind of operate in that in-between space because, yes, we do offer this cup service, um, re our reusable network, but we also just offer solutions and we're willing to connect people with um, orgs that are willing to help. So it's a, it's a unique space. <clears throat> Is there a specific job title or person that we should be looking for in our health departments to start these conversations? Um, you know, if we want to find out more or if we want to see how what we need to do to go about changing our local health codes. It's generally the environmental health department, so they're going to do sewer pools and and inspector restaurants. And then also having a local representative on board is really helpful. Um, so if you can get like a local um, Congress person that significantly helps. Awesome. So we have uh, another question from the chat, which is, um, how do we convince event producers, so now we're moving from restaurants to events, to choose reusable cups when they've been used to told to use compostable cups for so long? So this is an interesting point. So we have this, uh, I think, um, I can't remember who it was, one of you mentioned the compostables already. And so this difference between compostable, that's supposed to be good for the environment, right? compostable or reusable and and then how do we convince people to go reuse i want to say something about compostables if i may i uh there has been a number of reports i have been seeing about compostables and uh it's quite toxic and a lot of you know there is no uh standards or regulations at the uh government level and the companies can claim what they want even though there are two certification programs that I know of, uh, one is BPI certification, and then the other one is a new, uh, well, it's not new, but like a green a screen certificate. Uh, BPI certificate doesn't screen for PFAS, uh, only screen for PFAS. Well, maybe I misquote that, but they screen for BP, BPI certificate, screen for PFAS, but it doesn't screen for the regrettable substitutes. Um, and uh, the green screen certificate certificate uh, occasion, they they do uh, also the regrettable uh, 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 substitutes, but uh, the 
companies who are adopting those certificates are few and far between, and there are no regulations, and it's all voluntary. And there was a report from uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition re recently saying that like a lot of uh, so-called biodegradables and compostables actually com contain up to like something like 80% plastic and only like, you know, 20, 30% like organics. And um, it, it, there has been reports saying that like those compostables are very toxic. Uh, it contains PFAS in a lot of cases, and it's just not a good idea. So I really think that reuse is the way to go. Um, so I just wanted to put it out there um, because I think a lot of people do not know. And actually, Australia banned bioplastics for this reason and others. It's also such a headache in the waste stream. It usually ends up in the landfill. And it's never like, and then it's also contaminants in the compost system. Uh, so we are, we know that uh, uh, municipal composts are always most polluted and contaminated, tend to be contaminated because there are so many contaminants. In addition to regular plastic debris, people put in all these uh, so-called compostables. And um, I think uh, studies are coming out, you know, showing that like, you know, we have a problem there. There was a report from uh, Vermont. Uh, they had this like, um, um, this like uh, this big company called Casella had this uh, deep, something called deep packaging plant. Uh, they had this deep packaging plant to like, you know, presumably separate all these like, you know, food and, you know, plastic uh, foodwares and they're supposed to do it all magically, technically, but it wasn't happening and it was contaminating the farmlands with all the microplastics. And the University of Vermont did the study about that and, um, and you know, uh, people are upset. So like, we really need to think about like, you know, keeping contaminants out of our composting system. We have like, a, you know, uh, so Vermont is one of the pioneering states that does um, that created this like a universal composting law. And so is California. So like, I think we need to learn from the pioneers errors and uh, we need to, you know, try to keep our compost local uh, with lots of local actors involved and with a strong emphasis on uh, keeping the contaminants out of the composting stream. I just shared a letter from Oregon composters that, that gives like, I think it's nine reasons why they don't want compostables. Um, I, it's super interesting, but basically you, it's hard to replicate lab, laboratory compostable facilities in real practice. And so they can't um, assume that they're all gonna be broken down correctly. Um, but in terms of events, uh, Bold Reuse is doing a, a pilot with the Moda Center um, and having reusable cups at all Blazers games this season. Um, and they're projecting, I think, to save over like half a million um, cups. So it's a big deal and it's kind of the first of its kind. Um, I do really want to like problematize a little the use of plastic reusables. Um, we, we definitely want to prioritize um, stainless steel and other materials that um, are less likely to contaminate food and drinks. So, but yeah, it, events are really hard. There are some groups that target specifically um, events and like we'll have party catering packs for small scale things. And there's definitely networks out there, but um, I think offering or like just having a conversation with employees again is the my number one tip um and getting a group of people together that want to make a case for reusables at stadiums kelly did you have anything you wanted to add to the that point um in relationship to the food code the only state that has addressed events is california um, so you're still <laughs> maneuvering whatever state food code you are on, but the national code is silent on that kind of stuff. I think that's true for food codes, but also, uh, related to alcohol is a big one. Like a lot of events require you to have it in like a clear container that's not glass. And so that limits us as far as what types of materials we can use and things like that. So for safety, is that worth changing? Um, you know, those are questions too that are that are really important to ask. 
And um, I just wanted to point out the a couple of things that that y'all have said so far. And one of them is um, in relation to uh, just events in general. So I'll just plug an interview that we did in 2021 with our cup, now our world that does uh, reuse for events and large scale events. And so if you wanna hear a little bit more about that, take a look at that interview from a couple of years ago. Um, it's about uh, reusables and we do focus on the impacts of you know, the, the savings, the impacts, the environmental impacts, the impacts of plastics in general on our health and things like that in that interview as well. And then secondly, I kind of want to get into the, these health issues a little bit that come up um, with uh, PFAS, which is going to be our focus for next week. So we won't dive like too deep into that. Um, but it does bring up questions surrounding reuse and equity, which I think is a, an important part of this conversation because um, so many of the impacts of plastic production and things like that happen in you know communities that are already feeling the impacts of other environmental injustices and uh, economic injustices as well. So let's talk equity and reuse. The question specifically from the chat is, how do we scale reuse and make it equitable too? I can take a stab at this. Um, yeah, it's really hard. There's not a ton of funding for reuse initiatives. Um, and so a lot of the time funding has to get passed on to the consumer and it doesn't make it very equitable. Um, and yeah, there's there are people that have like core beliefs that there shouldn't be any borrow fees. And that's really hard to actually um, replicate on a large scale uh, unless there's like a, a giant backer or funding. Um, so finding more funding for that and especially like state and local funding is really important because there is money there and there definitely doesn't need to be a ton of money thrown at this issue, but it's definitely something that can be addressed um, with, uh, with adequate funding. Um, and I think uh, recently, I mean, Okapi got a grant this summer to offer our services for free for BIPOC owned cafes and just showing people that there are solutions out there um and expanding the the network of people that you expose your solution to is huge um just just the knowledge is really important um, to know it's happening um but yeah this is a question i think that everyone in the the reuse and refill communities is grappling with constantly um because it's something i think that we all hold at our core that it's hard to uh, take action on it sometimes i Go ahead, Yayoi. Okay, um, I want to say something uh, uh, in terms of like uh, equity to, uh, and uh, and BYO, and I think it's a really important piece because BYO is free for everyone. It doesn't cost a dime. Like you can bring a spaghetti jar and uh, and fill it with grains or you know nuts or whatever drinks anything it is absolutely like a very democratic initiative uh, that's grassroots bottom up um, and so i wanted to say that uh really make that really clearly and um like we are we are inundated with single use uh and um and it is convenient to continue to rely on single use uh, uh, but like um, switching, switching to BYO, uh, switching our behaviors is also, I feel, is like an integral part of um, creating a culture uh, from the bottom up grassroots level uh, to show up the support for reuse. Uh, so I, I really wanted to emphasize that like it is truly like uh, uh, e uh, BYO is uh, uh, BYO is really like a democratizing force, like of spreading the messages across the spectrum. Um, and I think it it it, it takes daily practice to uh, remind ourselves that we need to do this, and um, we shouldn't, you know, never ever underestimate. Uh, people's intelligence, like we, we can 
we can educate ourselves and uh, we can um, have people to, you know, make people to learn this, you know, new model behaviors. And without such a, like a, a groundswell of change, I don't think any other like uh, initiatives uh, for reuse is going to be like a truly uh, long lasting or successful because we need a uh, cultural change from bottom up, um, not just uh, you know, swap uh, this convenience with another convenience. That is great when we have already established like a bottom line consensus in the society. So I really wanted to say that BYO, it costs nothing. Uh, it saves money for the businesses. And that's partly, I feel, why um, it is not, you know, like uh, it is very difficult in the United States and it is allowed in other countries because there is no money in BYO. Uh, it is a complete, uh, um, it's a domain of people's own initiative and willingness for change, if, you, if it makes sense. Thank you. I think that's a great point economically. Um, and then it links directly into a question that I see in the chat actually, that um, you know we wanna promote BYO. And um, this is from uh, one of our friends in Baltimore is that the BYO Baltimore reduces campaign does it benefit Black Baltimore? And how is it equitable to ask the community that has other urgencies to now ask them to BYO? And so I guess that the question kind of revolves around like maybe not the economic issue, but maybe the mental, you know, energy, the mental load of having to, you know, remember this thing, remember this other thing, go find the shop. Maybe there, it's not the closest thing to you. Like there are other logistical elements that's that, that aren't related to economics, while that's a very important point. Um, that could influence the the uptake or not of BYO. Can I, can I speak chime in here, not specific necessarily to BYO, but just tie on to this a little bit. Um, fully agree with Yayoi that BYO is the equitable choice and it is democratic and anybody can participate but not everybody will want to participate. And I think that's getting to what maybe the question was just saying, right? Like I have seen families on the bus going to grocery shop with three small children. And I think asking that person to bring their containers with them may be something that would be difficult for them. So I will say, I think there needs to be third party wear washing, such as Margot's organization. Um, but I want to see those built in an equitable way. And so I don't want the McDonald's version or the Unilever version of a reuse infrastructure. I want one that has, because it is going to require labor to wash these things, one that's built equitably, democratically, under a cooperative movement that's sustainable in nature. And that's really what the center is advocating for. So, you know, both. We need BYO and we need third-party reuse, th third-party wear washing, but, but let's build that system so that it's hyper-local, so that you could transport things on bike, so that you could, you know, have a union of workers or, you know, whatever that may be. Um, and I think that can help you get to some of those equity issues, um, even if it is not BYO. And I will also say the other thing that somebody's mentioned about the deposit is, and this ties to some of the work that the center's doing too, is the center's working on building like a library of things model. And so you could check these out like a library book where maybe we don't need a deposit system. Um, or, you know, certain uh, demographics or something like that. 
Yeah, I can add a couple things. Uh, we rely on our cafes to wash, which saves us hugely in emissions and coordinating like van pickups for all the cups. Um, it does require some like cup rebalancing from here and then, but um, it's a great system. And a lot, some of our cafes do hand wash, but it's it's very few at this point, so we haven't run into any issues with that. But um, I think that saves us a lot um, on labor and everything else. But to your point about um, different groups, there are, um, so in like single use plastics and single use and disposables are like the number one littered thing at, like across the board. Um, and I think in major cities like in Portland, a lot of uh, marginalized communities live near freeways and other places where a lot of these things are discarded. Um, so there is a disp disproportionate amount of like things that people are exposed to if they're not using. And they're, they're, we just really want to focus on making sure that the solutions are getting to the communities that are feeling the effect of the, these problems. Um, and so making sure that they're accessible to people, they're, they are where um, different groups of people are going. Um, so we really wanna, in, in my case, we really wanna have a broad um, slew of cafes that we service and a different variety in our network um, just to make sure that we're hitting all the, the targets, but it's a really hard um, piece to tackle for sure. I agree. Um, I agree with both of you that, like in you know, a local uh, deposit return system, is extremely important uh, for the people who can't uh, afford the luxury of, you know, bringing, you know, keeping their own containers all the time. You know, commuting with bikes or, you know, being on the bus systems and things like that. Um, I think my uh, my comment early on was uh, coming because BYO tends to be pushed around. There is no money in it, and it seems like such a humble program. And it it seems like there's like a big reuse on the way. And um, you know, even though most of the businesses out there are small ones that uh, I absolutely support and I absolutely love, uh, but a lot of there are a lot of like. Um, uh, pushbacks for BYO, such as being commented on, like it is anti-equity or like all the zero waste business, you know, practices are like, you know, uh, we are, uh, you know, criticized for being anti-equality or anti, uh, and, and I, I want to say this to you, if my personal example means anything, I am, I raised my son she, he's 23 years old and I was a single mom all throughout his life. I raised him by myself and I have been uh, on the bus. I walked and I carried three bags of grocery stores uh, through, and I've done all of that things. And I, it's not, it's not that, but I'm so tired of it. I, I'm, you know, my son's uh, older and and you know now I have time. And then looking back, I keep thinking about all the waste I created. And and oh, my son also has uh, Asperger's, and he was diagnosed with ADHD when he was three. And I was told to put him on Ritalin, and I didn't want to do that. You know, I it was just so wrong. So that's why I embarked on this journey of going zero waste. So to call the zero waste practices or like this bring your own container campaigns as anti-equity is to say, no, like it's just so not right to me because I feel that um, where I come from, I, I have been, you know, I'm, I have been like, uh, you know, I'm not wealthy by all means. And I struggled raising my son. And I've seen like, I, I always suspect like something in the environment affected his you know, symptoms. And, and it, it, these people come tell me it's anti-equity. And for what um, I advocate is um, it doesn't, it, you, you, people seem to lack the context. And there are so many uh, people from so many different walks of life in this zero waste sphere. We want to make a difference. I am not wealthy, bougie, um, you know, like, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm not that. I am just uh, like everyday people. 
And I'm really tired of the deluge of waste, so-called waste, you know, that is uh, destroying our planet, uh, literally. And, and that's why I'm here. And I advocate BYO and zero waste for this reason. Thank you. Thank you, Yayoi. I think that that's a really important story to tell. I appreciate you sharing your, your personal experience. And I think there are lots of people who are, who are passionate and willing to, you know, to make those changes and reduce waste and, you know, see the health impacts that, that can come from that. And um, yeah, I just, I just want to say thank you. Because you're so right. I mean, you, you've said already, like, don't underestimate people's intelligence and, and I think that's true. Don't underestimate people's willingness either. Um, it's just that we need to we need governments and we need organizations and businesses to help make it a little easier, right? Maybe through incentives, which can bring us to to another question um, that comes from the chat. Which, depending on the time, this may be our last question. We'll see. Um, but the question says, how do we push local governments to incentivize third party vendors or BYO, whichever it is, um, to help make that happen? Maybe not just through changing ordinances and food codes, but through actual maybe grants or incentives and things like that. Yeah, in Seattle, um, Reuse Seattle is doing this great program where you can get $500 to put towards switching to reusables, either for dine-in or for takeout. Um, and that's a huge, and I mean, if you do the math, that can cover someone for uh, like up to six months or almost a year. Um, so I think monetary incentives are always huge. Um, and people are, if there's money, a lot of people are willing to do it, but there isn't money, so they can't make the switch. Um, or they don't have the time or someone to help them. So that's a huge program that um, we're hoping to find, like get something in Portland soon. Um, but that's a great way. Just give the give the people the money and they'll make it happen. A lot of that's my uh, my thing a lot of the time. <laughs> Any other thoughts about incentives or? or other ways that we can make this happen um, or personal stories that y'all might wanna share. On a smaller like cafe scale, we do work with a lot of cafes that add on costs for paper cup and you'll get a discount for if you bring your own or you like use an Okapi cup. Um, and so there's like different menu prices versus like according to what cup you're gonna use. Um, so we've seen success with that uh, the like cost differentiation, even if it's just a little bit, it's enough for people to think like, oh, I could be saving 25 cents. Um, so some people are all about the money. Some people are about the economics, uh, like that side of it. And some people are about the, the waste side. So I think finding the different avenues to reach people and um, get that behavior change is really important. I think the non-monetary side of things would be like the example that Yayoi gave of her sticker, right? So you show um, your values of the cafe. So I used to work in local government. You could do a story about those cafes that are putting up the stickers. You could, um, you know, put them in your newsletter, post them on social media, you know, uh, kind of these non-monetary things that a local government may be able to leverage out of their comms department. Yeah, I've seen those done uh, in uh, municipalities in Canada. I think it was St. Lawrence and it's beautiful. Like the governments are doing it and they have staff members to do it. Uh, we are volunteer organization in Ithaca. And then like, uh, I have to say that like as a local grassroots environmental organization, you know, it's very hard to get likes on social media. I mean, like you get one or two you know, for a post and then like we start posting about our local businesses and you just start getting like 10, 20, 30, 40. If we get 50, that's like a huge, like it's like, wow, it's so amazing, you know? Um, so it's just like, you know, like, and, and just it just shows how much people love their local businesses. And we haven't been able to work with like, you know, big corporate uh counterparts like you know mcdonald's and they would never accept that like you know we we tried a few of them but 
uh, they have to go to regional managers and, you know, really never heard back from any of them. Uh, but like, you know, the local businesses, they love it. It's, it's like a f- um, free advertisement and it just f- it generates such good vibes in the communities. Um, so, yeah, definitely no monetary, but like, um, you know, uh, very, it's, it's great to create uh, good vibes in the community. And it's really fun because people love local businesses. No, that's exactly what we want to do is, is support our local businesses and, and, you know, create that sense of community that like, you know, the businesses are providing a service for us, they're helping us out, and then we're helping out our community by not creating all this waste. Um, and so hopefully, that means that, uh, that our audience has been, you know, inspired and, and motivated by this conversation to maybe reach out to their local health department, maybe reach out to some local businesses and hashtag just ask, right? So we're going to, we're going to start that off too. We have just a couple of minutes left. So I want to leave a time, like maybe one minute for each of you to give some, you know, parting words, some, a bit of advice or anything that's left that, that you haven't said that you'd like to say, um, just for zero waste month and, and to motivate or encourage people to take action. What are your final thoughts. Um, I'll have Kelly go first. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I do want to promote a um, film and webinar series that we're doing and it starts tonight. So um, this discussion about building out co-ops and equitable businesses um, is going to be the, the the topic of today's uh, uh, film and, and webinar. So And then we are also going to do one on plastics and the reproductive health harms of plastics kind of across the life cycle. That's in two weeks from now. Um, So people can go to bit.ly slash eh-rh films 2023. So would love to see you there. And we'll add that in the chat as well. So that'll be available for people to easily click on and then you don't have to remember the long link. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, and then, yeah, take action, right? Like change your change your local food codes or, well, change. That makes it sound easy. It's not that easy. It will take time and effort, but we, we encourage you and motivate you to make the effort. And next I'll have Margo. Yeah, I just want to say there's always people in your community that are thinking the same thing. Um, and if you find those people, and even if it's a small number of you, that can be huge. Uh, there's different networks online there where you can search for like small community groups. Um, but I think those local groups are so important. Um, and they also usually have like ties to municipalities or different like larger um, corporations. So find those groups that you like feel heard in or your values are well represented and they more more often than not need help. So I think joining the local groups and yeah, just going to your favorite cafe or your favorite restaurant and asking about reusables. Um, that's huge. And tell your friends. I mean, this is this is for everybody. Um, we want people that are like uh, zero waste rock stars, but we also want people who are just curious and just want to learn more and not necessarily change their whole life. So I think keeping that open to everyone is something that is really important. Thanks, Margo. And Yayoi, your last, last words, last comments? Um, yes, um, I hundred uh, percent agree with Margo, and uh, you know, uh, joining the local movement, or uh, if there isn't any, y- you can start your own. And I always feel that like there's so much power when you have more than just one person. Um, you know, um, if you are just picking trash by yourself, like you're one crazy person you start doing with two or three more people then you people start noticing asking questions and start saying thank you and you start to get noticed uh so i really hope that like you know people will you know start their own groups and or like join existing groups and and also uh, you know join our network and we are here to support each other um so, and uh, I just wanted to also say that Kelly's uh, film series sounds really fantastic. And I'm, I registered and I'm looking forward to watching that. 
uh, some of the films in there. So I recommend, uh, I, I, I urge people to check it out. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I definitely agree with like getting involved with groups or being that crazy person who just does it on their own. Like it may be weird and, you know, you may feel awkward, but somebody's going to notice and get involved too. And I just think there are so many groups doing so many amazing things for the environment. And even if it's not specifically related to reuse or zero waste, like the people who are interested in wildflower conservation, those people could also be interested in reducing waste. And maybe there's just not a group for that yet. So even getting involved in other types of environmental groups can lead to this kind of BYO campaign or starting to talk about how do we get together as a community and change these health codes or change these municipal regulations to, to allow us to do refill and reuse. So get involved wherever you are in your community, however you can is, is the best advice I think that we can give. And once you do it, share it with us. Use the hashtag Zero Waste Month. Let us know what you did. Let us know if you, you know, managed to meet up with somebody or change something or even use the hashtag just ask or take your reusable or finally remember to take your reusable container. Because I think remembering is also one thing that we, we all need to work on sometimes. Um, so thank you once again to all of our interviewees for being here. And thank you once again to all of our promotional partners and speakers who are joining us for this year's Zero Waste Month. And a big shout out to Zero Waste Sonoma, our sponsor. And join us next week, next Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Central European time. We will be on to talk about PFAS. So we've teased it a little in this particular conversation, talking about health and things. And next week will be a deep dive on that topic. So we hope you'll join us. We hope you'll be there. And as usual, use the hashtag Zero Waste Month to share your actions and to share what you've learned. Thanks so much, folks. <laughs>